Boom, boom, boom. Open up. It's the Sixers Talk podcast knocking at your door. So glad to be with you once again. Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, and our producer, Ben Barry, making things happen behind the scenes. Uh, we're brought to you by Wilmington University. And uh, so much to talk about after just one basketball game, Noah. And it was an emotional one in South Philly with James Harden and the Clippers uh, coming uh, this way after the Sixers beat them out west. Did not get the win last night, as many of you may know. Um, and I think it's probably best to start at the end, Noah, because after the game, we found out with all the hoopla and the hysterics toward the end, the maddest I've ever seen Nick Nurse personally in a Sixers uniform, a uh, Sixers uh, sideline. But the referees after the game, and I don't even know if it was the last two minute report, but they said that a foul should have been called on that final play uh, with Kelly Oubre driving to the basket. Um, people were frantic and screaming, shoot the ball, but he tried to take it to the rack. Paul George leaned in, Guy gave him a lot of body on the way to the basket. There was no call and hysteria kind of ensued from there with um, Kelly Oubre <laughs> calling the refs out of their name afterward and apologizing in the locker room. Um, it's one of those things that maybe people out there know or don't know, Noah, but I'm sure you could write your game story as the game goes on. Was this one of those where you had to like change a bunch of stuff afterward because of so much coming out at the end or how did that all go for you? It was especially challenging. Yeah. There's <laughs> just a lot of, a lot of scrambling to make it all work, but yeah. So that was um, crew chief um, Kevin Scott to uh, the poor reporter who was, was Keith Pompey last night, and I actually have have taken on um, pool reporter responsibilities this year as well. I remember you saying that, yes. So, uh, which I'm, I'm glad to do, try to chip in in these moments, but we split it up, and uh, Keith, Keith was the guy last night, so uh, he was asking those questions about all, all these controversial moments, several in, the, in those last uh, stages of the game, and it does seem like this year there's a little more willingness to just straight up admit when you got something wrong. I didn't think this was a blatant error in real time, but the official in a one story, point game, it yeah means more than yeah, maybe right. in the past. Course, yeah, all right. But he said like Paul George drifted to his left. You know, in the moment we thought he maintained verticality, but upon review that was not the case, and we got the call wrong. So. If that had panned out differently, you get Kelly Oubre at, at the line, Sixers down one, and he has two clutch free throws on his plate. Uh, but the Sixers ultimately uh, were, were not so fortunate as for the officials to have that view when it actually mattered the most. And boy, yeah, Nick Nurse chased down the official. <laughs> he, often, he often does get heated in support of his players. He's clearly a fiery, passionate guy when it comes to having his guys back. And in, in that moment, I'm sure that was an aspect of it, but I think a lot of it was just pure rage and feeling like his team had been hard done by. Um, so I, I understand it. I think, of course, there were factors within the Sixers' control that led to them not holding the lead. And Kawhi Leonard, who Nick Nurse knows well, was downright brilliant down the stretch of this game. But the officials played a really large role. That's usually not a good thing. And uh, the Sixers were the team left feeling aggrieved at the end of this. And uh, I understand the frustration a lot, though I do think inevitably uh, the way Kelly Oubre Jr. and Nick Nurse <laughs> handled things is, is going to lead to some fines. And I'm sure we'll be he hearing today about the follow up from that. So I've got to imagine uh, fines are, are coming their way after being extraordinarily adamant that the officials did a did a poor job there on the last play. Yeah, on the last play in particular. Um, and, you know, we don't have to Zapruder film this whole thing because that, that's exactly what they did in the moment, looking at these reviews. And it's easy to come out on the other side of some of these reviews uh, when it happens to your team, right? It's like, man, like they're looking at so many little details and how could they get it right? And maybe they should just review, you know, 
the play as it would have been from their eyes. Like instead of looking at all the little different angles, just take it at what it is face value. If you see something different than what you saw, then you just make the call as opposed to, you know, dissecting it from so many ways. But, um, you know, they have calls go their way. They have calls not go their way. You mentioned, you know, the things that were in the Sixers control. Tyrese Maxey falls down on the inbounds and the ball goes to the Clippers. They score, um, you know, that jump ball that was called, which wasn't able to be reviewed, I think was even more detrimental than maybe a lot of the other things that happened because maybe the Sixers would have got two shots instead of the jump ball, which um, didn't go their way. But do, do we, are we at a point now where the reviews are hurting the game in some ways? Because like I said, we don't want to go into too much detail because there's so many plays that you could talk about there in the final few sec- few minutes. But, you know, P- Ty Lue's awarded another challenge and it it's disrupts the flow of the game. And there's so many, um, you know, so much going on with the fans invested and you're sitting and waiting and sitting on your hands a bit. Um, th- how much did the reviews, you think, take away from the momentum of what was happening on the court? And... I, I'm sure you have an opinion on whether they got it right or wrong, but what what did you think of how things transpired there in that last few minutes with possessions and what the referees did? No, I mean, I think last night was a great example where the rhythm was 100% disrupted. We had a really great, exciting game on our hands, and one or two of those reviews were dragging on for, for many minutes on end. Uh, so I think ideally it's a quick process, but I think we're at the point where – Reviews are a part of the game that, you know, but all teams know that this is a strategic element and uh, you've got to handle it as well as you can. And I think what's of utmost important is getting, getting it right. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and at the end of the day, it was striking to me that Ubre and the Sixers feel that they got the call wrong, even when they took a very long, close look at it on the play. Um, the out of bounds call. So Maxi had the you know turnover with the slip that you mentioned. Uh, then Coffee goes one for two at the line. Um, Batum gets the defensive board, throws it to Ubre, and there's a play where Paul George is in the backcourt. It looks like maybe it goes off Ubre's knee, um, and yeah, they just took such a long look at it. And Kelly Ubre said, I-, "I didn't feel like I got a great explanation." They basically just said, "Yeah, we made the call. Move on." And he wasn't happy about that. And uh, I agree with him. I think, yeah, like sure to a certain extent, especially if you've already taken that much time, you've got to keep the game moving. You don't necessarily owe a player, you know, a two minute detailed explanation in the moment. Sure. But man, that's certainly not, not what you're going for when the review itself is very lengthy. And then like, it doesn't feel like a satisfactory answer or in Ubre's mind, like the correct answer uh, so, yeah, there, there's always some subjectivity. I think the idea is the reviews, especially if they're going to be taking time and killing rhythm, should be eliminating a lot of that and should be enhancing accuracy and precision. Uh, but I don't think last night was a banner one in, in any of those departments. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, the, the NBA uh, definitely, I think, you know, does, doesn't make its officials look too great when – there's a review like that that they put such a great emphasis on. And then one of the players still leaves feeling like they got it entirely wrong. So yeah, Kelly Oubre Jr. I think uh, did his best post game to blend the, the apologetic tone with uh, the steadfast belief that he and the Sixers uh, kind of got the short end of the stick here on how the game was officiated in in the last minute or so. And yeah, like, as I said, you just, you never want to be talking this much about officiating. I think if you are, right. it usually means the job done was was not very good. Yeah, well said, Noah. Um, articulated that point well, and I just feel like you know, it, it, it. The thing is, is that whether they get it right or wrong, you want to understand their perspective. But in this instance, those things led to the fuse being lit on a powder keg of frustration annoyance and that was part of the catalyst those reviews as to the eruption we saw at the end of the game and I just keep laughing at it because um Kelly Oubre with a, a memeable moment 
uh, the way he's speaking to those referees. Nick Nurse is going crazy, and Ubre is in his feelings. But to his credit, he quickly was um, apt to apologize in the locker room and you know take the blame for his emotions getting out of control, saying that was something that he has to work on. And listen, um, he's a, a fiery guy. He brings a lot of energy to court, and you could just see him out there with the Clippers last night why he would have been so valuable at the end of the Sixers road trip when uh, he was hurt against the Kings and it was really all Tyrese Maxey. Um, but when the game finishes, the players go their separate ways. Everyone's trying to dissect what happens. In the end, the Sixers are in the eighth seed. They're half game back of the Heat, one and a half back of the Pacers. And we talked about this stretch of games and what they would need to do in order to put themselves in a better position and giving themselves an opportunity to have something for Joel Embiid to come back to. So we did get a little bit of an update on Joel Embiid. Um, can you give us the information on his status, what, what we know, when he may be able to come back? Um, it seems like things are trending toward you know April. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Nick Nurse still pretty reluctant to provide specifics when he when he's pressed on what exact work Embiid is doing. He says he's doing skill work, and you know he's continuing to ramp up and and do all the things the Sixers Sixers want. But uh, yeah, it does does certainly seem like the the optimism remains. And Nurse was specifically asked. What, what would you say the likelihood is that Embiid returns this regular season? He said very good likelihood. You know, it's it's all been consistent. That things are going well in their eyes, but they're unwilling to, to give us an exact date or an exact timeline. And clearly we can say it's going to be soonish at this point because there's there's nine games left. Uh, so, yeah, well, I'm sure we'll learn learn more in the coming days. Sixers do practice today and. We'll see uh, what we learn about him be today, whether he participates in some of the practice. I think that would be telling um, if he indeed does. And then, uh, yeah, also notable, interesting pregame that uh, Nurse said Robert Covington and DeAnthony Melton, he's also hopeful those guys are back by the end of this regular season. Unsurprisingly, he framed it as Covington is ahead of Melton in the process and progressing well, but didn't rule D'Anthony Melton out by any means and said the hope is still that he's uh, back out there. So uh, that that is all still, I think, looming large over everything for the Sixers. Still, still a good degree of uncertainty, but pretty definitive last night that at least the you know hopeful expectation is that they're getting three uh, key players back before what's looking now like it, it might be the play-in tournament. Or, or perhaps the playoffs. And listen, um, Joel Embiid may be the type of player who can step back in and, and reclaim some of his form in, in a quitty, pretty quick order. But that's what makes him an MVP caliber player. That's what makes him a generational type of talent. But it, it ain't just, you know, a drop in the bucket to just step back out there on the court and regain that game rhythm and that game flow. Um, reincorporate with your teammates uh so it, the sooner the better these guys can get back in there and get reacclimated because uh the playoffs are looming they have to be really be a part of what the sixers are doing now with their actions and you know not just you know cheering from the bench so it could be an adjustment period is what i'm saying i'm so proud of us noah that we're able to get this deep into the podcast and not talk about all of the james harden stuff um and it, there was plenty to talk about. Uh, we will get to that after we take a quick time out here on the Sixers Talk podcast. Uh, let's pay some bills and talk about our sponsors and what they do for us. Uh, we are proudly brought to you by Wilmington University. Find your higher education home at Wilmington University, where your academic success is celebrated by a caring community. Explore your opportunities at wilmu.edu. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on open table. Back here on the Sixers Talk podcast, the beard was in the building, Noah. 16 points, 14 assists. Uh, not much of a factor down the stretch, though. 
although um, there was so much going on that um, this, the Clippers didn't need him as they were able to hang on to this one point win. Um, once again, we're going to start at the end. And he was in the locker room holding court after not doing so when the Sixers beat the Clippers in L.A. And he was a bit um, perplexed on why the fans might be booing him, uh, why they had that vitriol for him. And uh, you were there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you were in the locker room with James. I'm, I'm just saying you were there uh, gathering sound, working, uh, applying your trade and craft. Um, d- did you go to the locker room to speak with James? Okay. Um, so g- give me an idea of, of what the mood was like. Um, were you, uh, you know, silently, you know, rolling your eyes at some of the comments and uh, surprised by how the stance he took? Or did you feel like uh, his perspective was merited? Um, I wouldn't say his perspective is his perspective, right? So <laughs> feels the things he does. I mean, look at the, the comment he made about I don't understand. I don't understand why they were booing. I don't. Even, I don't. I don't even think the Sixers fans know why they were booing. I don't read that as entirely sincere, right? He fully understands it was a long, dramatic, messy saga. These are fans of the Sixers. He's no longer a Sixer. He's he's, in a super, he's still a star player. He's going to get a lot of booze. I think he was more just kind of passive aggressively making the point that he made a lot of really positive contributions in Philadelphia. He was very successful here in terms of the statistical accomplishments, et cetera. And therefore, why would you boo someone like that? I think it's, it's clearly not a point that's going to be seen as especially credible in uh, the Philadelphia region. But yeah, the, the boos were, were loud for him. I would say they did not reach Ben Simmons level because there was, just, was not as much of a history, right? Ben Simmons, number one pick, so much hope, so much disappointment, uh, so much, you know, late uh, drama in that, you know, tenure, whatever. But, you know, games hardened. It was a season and a half and it had some wild ups and downs and, and fluctuations in, in moods and fortunes from, from all parties. Uh, but look, I, I thought it was pretty predictable that he was glad to talk about Tyrese Maxey and uh, his pride in, in the way Maxey has grown and become an all-star and just teaching, trying to teach Maxey to become more consistent. Um, so yeah, that that was not a shocker, but it was still neat, neat to hear his his comments on that. And then in contrast, boy, he had zero to say on Daryl Morey and Joel Embiid. So Morey, uh, you know, he was asked, do you you think you'll ever patch things up? Nope, nope, hell hell no. And then Joel Embiid, do do you talk with him? Do you still keep a relationship with him? That that was also a no. So uh, zero. Quick no, nah. Surprising. Pretty quick on the no, Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, he made the, the comments in his first Clippers press conference about how he had to defer a lot in Philadelphia and he's not a system player. He's a system. And Embiid, in response to that, had said, I didn't really see it that way. I, I thought things were pretty good, you know, with us as a duo on the court. Wh- whatever the, the case may be, um, James Harden is not still tight with uh, Joel Embiid by his own estimation. Uh, so uh, that did stand out to me and he, uh, yeah, he had a winning, winning return ultimately in Philadelphia, um, pretty solid night. And to, to your point about how we're only now getting to him, I think it was not at all expected that he would be relatively, uh, low on the, the intrigue scale, you know, when all is said and done, I think he had a, you know, perfectly decent game played pretty well, said what he had to say after the game, but all the uh, officiating controversy and Kawhi Leonard greatness down the stretch and, you know, other storylines actually rose above James Harden in in a mini upset. And listen, um, fans can feel the way they want to. And and by no means do I think that Tyrese Maxey would not have been the caliber of player we see now without meeting and interacting with James Harden as the level that he did, but you got to give him some credit, man. And, um, 
and and honestly, he might be taking a little less um, adoration than he deserves for the help or what he provided for Tyrese Matt and Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid does the Harden step back move as well, um, and and has mastered it. So, I, you know, you can say that they might have picked that up by film study or being the astute students of the game that they are, but. You can boo Harden all you want because he forced his way out of here. He had some, um, you know, sharp comments about the Sixers front office, particularly Daryl Morey. And he definitely isn't a very apologetic guy. He says a lot of things so matter of fact as if, you know, that's just the way they are and you need to, you know, take it or leave it because it's still going to be that way, that type of attitude. But he had an imprint here that uh, has a lasting effect because of the trickle down process to Maxi and Embiid. So um, I'm, I'm not a fan of the way things ended, but at the same time, um, he has an imprint here <laughs> that is really hard to deny. And um, yeah, he, he got booed. That, that's what, what, what happens here. And that's what should have happened. And it did, and like you said, it didn't overshadow the game. It just brought some color and character to what happened at the arena, and it, it made it great, man. It, it made it fun. There's nothing like having a villain. It's nothing like having someone to cheer against as you're trying to root on the home team. So he was the villain that night. I don't imagine that he'll get booed every time he comes to Philly like Ben Simmons, but um, – you know, it was, the way they erupted after he missed that deep three to start the game because of the booze, it's nothing like the connection between the deep, long sound of the booze and then a the giant cheer afterwards. So it, it just it was a great atmosphere. It was a packed house, a lot of casuals showing up. And, man, there were people leaving at the, you know, eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Like, the, the, there was a lot of traffic um, leaving the arena. Um because we have a vantage point, you know, seeing outside Wells Fargo. But all that to say, uh, a fun game, but um, one of the Sixers definitely needed. And I don't know if we can transition in this way, Noah, or if you have more to say there about heart, feel free. Um, but from a coaching standpoint, um, this was a great game for Mo Bamba. Um, a double-double. Um, the Sixers go small down the stretch. It was – is there – uh, a little bit of regret Nick Nurse's way about how he might have handled the substitution pattern or having a rim protector in there might have benefited the Sixers more? Do you feel like they're, that's something that they're uh, thinking about or, or reviewing or looking over about how they handled that down the stretch? Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely Bamba's probably best game as the Sixers. He's only double-double thus far. Um, I do think it, it felt like Nick Nurse generally pressed the right buttons as far as which role players to turn to in which spots. He recognized really early campaign did not have it going. Campaign only mm -hmm. played four minutes and uh, Buddy Heald got a deserved extended run in the second half and at the end of the game because he was cooking and scored, I think, 15 of his 17 after halftime. Uh, Batum was relied on down the stretch against his old team, made a couple of big corner threes, had a great block on Harden. Uh, so, yeah, I thought personnel wise, like most of the decisions made sense to me. Um, I think the Sixers did have a couple unforced errors late that I don't really attribute to coaching, like bite, biting on pump fakes and, you know, sending unnecessary help at certain players. Um, and then, of course, the, the turnovers as well. Um, and, and look, like Kawhi Leonard was bad for most of this game. I think he started, you know, one for 12 from the floor and you just knew that wasn't going to happen the whole game. And then he just dialed it up into finals MVP mode. Um, and, and the Sixers didn't have any answers against that. So no, like personally, I, I don't think I would have been inclined to, to go Bamba down the stretch. I think though he gave himself, um, some, some positive stock with how he played and it would have been fair enough if the. Sixers, you know, gave, gave that a shot. Um, but yeah, you know, as far as the late game coaching, I was a little surprised that Tyrese Maxey didn't get more touches, more emphasis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, the play where Leonard had that, that great block, 
um, Maxi was being face guarded in the back court, and the Sixers just kind of let that happen, and you know went to Ubre as as their guy there, and Kawhi Leonard said, "Nope, not not on my watch." Um, so, you know, if if we're scrutinizing or second guessing, that was a little strange to me, just not to at least put the ball in Maxi's hands and and see what would happen from there, knowing the attention he was drawing. Um, but look, I, I think the Sixers. And Nick Nurse did a ton well to get to a point where they had a fourth quarter lead. And then, of course, uh, a few things need to go wrong. And great players like Kawhi Leonard need to be great. And uh, officiating decisions need to break your way for (laughs) for that lead to go down the drain. Um, But, boy, yeah, the Sixers were awesome in this game, I think, for the large majority of it defensively. And Kawhi Leonard um, made everything that he needed to late in that game through through contact and and through whatever you know the Sixers uh through his way a fun game not co- going the Sixers way they move on to Cleveland on Friday or excuse me um is that is that a Friday name okay sorry um days running together here for me but uh they move on to Cleveland on Friday <clears throat> is the effort here to avoid the eighth seed as much as possible like you don't want to see Boston in the first round it's just it's not the way you want this thing to go if they're going to make this type of run um we know how this movie ends with the celtics and uh obviously they are really you know flexing their muscles uh currently they just blew a 30 point lead the other night but um (laughs) they are flexing their muscles um do you think that that is the most favorable path for this team, like, like avoiding that eighth seed has just got to be at the top of the list. I think so. Yeah. I think, you know, ideally you avoid the play in entirely, but uh, yes, if you're going to be a play in team, it sure better be the, the seven as opposed to the eight. I think regardless, they're in a spot where they've got to pull off some upsets and, and make an improbable run. That said, they are more likely to do that than the average team in this position because of the optimism that they'll get an MVP level player back, as well as potentially one or two other, you know, pretty decent uh, role players in Melton and Covington. But yeah, you don't want to face the Boston Celtics in, in the first round of the playoffs. Um, I, I don't think any any other team in the East desires that. I mean, they've been head and shoulders above the rest of the conference all year. And of course, yeah, if, if you're the two seed, there are a variety of potential matchups. Could be Cleveland, which you know, would be decent for the Sixers. Could be Milwaukee. Um, you know, there are, there are still different options at play there. But yeah, if, if you're going to be a play-in team, uh, boy, you, you don't want that to be how it breaks. Uh, I think that's, that's very clear to me. And you just see... Um the evidence of what the teams that are healthy or coming together here at the end of the season are able to do right now and where the Sixers might have trouble reincorporating some of these former, you know, guys getting healthy, you know, the Knicks hang a buck 45 on the board, you know, last night. Um, Mitchell Robinson Robinson back for them, which is huge. right, Right. So it's just, you know, they're getting players back, getting healthy, you know, the Nova Knicks and, and their camaraderie is coming together. It's it just the Sixers I have a, a bit of catching up to do. So hopefully it all comes together. Anything we didn't touch on um, that, you know, we need to talk about, Noah? Um, I feel like uh, we pretty much summed it up. Uh, good to have Kelly Oubre back out there. Um, and, you know, hopefully this thing comes together as the Sixers hit Cleveland. But, uh, you know, here 0 for 1 on this uh, 10 game stretch as they probably need to go 7 and 2 here <laughs> 6 and 3 quite possibly yeah i mean the pacers surprisingly got blown out by the bulls so what we're just projecting that they might need to go 7 and 2 maybe something less than that'll be sufficient but yeah right now they're looking up at both uh, miami and indy so uh, it is looking probable that you need to finish strong. But yeah, I think Ubre's return was <clears throat> significant outside of all the drama related to things besides his performance on the court. 
And yeah, we should probably also note that he was candid in admitting that he's nowhere near 100%. He joked that he he saw the chiropractor and got snapped, crackled, and popped every bone in his body. And he said he feels a little better, but right now he's just essentially grinding through it. And that's the case for many people in the league, many people on this team. You know, Mo Bamba had a moment where uh, he was flexing that right knee, which has been problematic for him a lot of the season. Of course, didn't prevent him from from playing very well. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it's a situation where if you're available, that that's good. Um, and, and the Sixers will, will take availability over all else. Um, of course, they would love players to be feeling their absolute best. But, you know, part of the deal, too, when you're shorthanded is sometimes that, like compounds on itself. You know, sometimes a guy like Tyrese Maxey has to play 44 minutes and then he's going to be a little more fatigued. He's going to be feeling a little bit worse. Sixers just kind of have to have to make do with the cards they've been dealt here. Um, and yes, having Kelly Oubre Jr. back is a good thing is while it's going to be a little lighter next time we talk, I think we can, uh, we can mark that one down and I'm sure we will be uh, hearing the exact word of the MBAs. Um, you know, discipline there in, in the near future for Ubre. And uh, yeah, as we said, like good, good on him, good on him for you know, <laughs> I can't like, stop laughing about that. Dude. Like very, uh, very accurate to say that was the heat of the moment and that he lost his pool <laughs> and that uh it is behavior that the league is is probably gonna wanna not condone from from Kelly Ubre. Listen, I, I know those referees hear some audacious stuff, uh, but being able to read Kelly Oubre's lips, <laughs> just see, <laughs> just seeing him right in their face, like something about is just being held back. Yeah, it just, yeah, yeah. Oh, something man. about the scene, the scene too. So just like looking right, exactly. um, on Getty, like looking on Getty images for some of the photos, you see, you know, as Nick Nurse is still mid rant, uh, you know, guys catching up and smiling, you know, Harden and Maxi, you know, PJ Tucker and Embiid. <laughs> And then you see, like, in the corner of the frame, Nick Nurse is, you know, chewing the official's ear off and Kelly Oubre is, like, you know, <laughs> saying his piece. Um, so just the, the juxtaposition there, I think, was something you're only going to get in basketball, something you're only going to get in a, in a weird Sixers game. And, uh, that, yeah, this one definitely delivered, you know, in a, in a stretch where things have sometimes been not the most exciting or um, kind of predictable. I think this one uh, – this one had it all, not a Sixers win, but it, it had a lot else uh, to offer. And it was a national broadcast. So there was, you know, all of that, you know, stuff incorporated with it. It was a little later start than 730. It just had all the build up, And uh, man, it, it really was uh, something to watch down the stretch because you just are so emotionally invested in every little bounce and turn. Like, what? How could you? excuse me like what is their ball like how did that happen that's not a foul it just it had all that that stuff that uh makes fans just stand on their feet so tough one by the sixers uh be sure to check out noah Levick's work on nbc sports philadelphia.com uh and uh we will be here every step of the way as this thing comes to a close we appreciate you watching and listening on the sixers talk podcast brought to you by wilmington university will works for noah Levick. I'm Danny Pommels. We'll see you next time.